Hello, welcome to On Wildlife. I'm your host, Alex Ray. On this podcast, we bring the wild to you. We take you on a journey into the life of a different animal every week. And I guarantee you, you're going to come out of here knowing more about your favorite animal than you did before. Water dipper, snake doctor, adder bold, and darning needle. What do all of these words have in common? Well, they're all different species names of the animal that we're talking about this week. This is probably an animal that you've seen flying around your backyard, and no matter how many times you see them, it's always amazing to watch them in flight. So join me as we look at some of the most recognizable insects in the world. Dragonflies. The dragonfly's aerial acrobatics have awarded it with many nicknames, like the ones that I previously mentioned in the intro, and they can be found almost anywhere in the world. In fact, they inhabit every continent except for Antarctica. Dragonflies are a major area of study for scientists because they've been able to adapt tremendously to their changing surroundings, and we're going to talk about that later on in the episode. They've done this by altering their vision, their flight, and their reproductive habits because of what's going on around them. There are over 6,000 species of dragonfly, and they come in all sizes. Some of the largest species are the giant petal tail and the giant darner dragonfly. The giant petal tail, which is actually the largest in the world, is found near Queensland, Australia, and you can recognize them by their black coloration and yellow markings. Their wingspan can get to be over 6 inches long, and the dragonfly itself can be around 4 inches long. The giant darner dragonfly, which is the largest in the U.S., can be found from Texas all the way to California, and they have green heads and can grow to be around 13 centimeters long and have a 5-inch wingspan. Some of the smallest species are the scarlet dwarf and the elfin skimmer. Don't dragonflies have the coolest names? The Scarlet Dwarf lives in some parts of Asia like Japan and Borneo. They only get up to around 16 millimeters in length, and their wingspan is less than an inch. And in the U.S., the Elfin Skimmer is the smallest dragonfly. It's found in the eastern United States and is about 20 millimeters long. A dragonfly's body is divided into three parts, just like any other insect, with a head, thorax, and abdomen. Probably some of their most prominent features are their oversized eyes, and they're there for a reason. Have you ever been on a roller coaster going through all these twists and turns, and for a few seconds you don't have any idea whether you're facing up or down? Well, dragonflies' eyes are built to prevent against this. They're thought to detect different levels of light from the sky and the land's surface to orient themselves after their quick and acrobatic moves during flight. But this isn't the only thing that helps dragonflies fly. Their abdomen is much longer and more slender than most other insects. Their abdomen is also extremely flexible, and it basically acts as a rudder for in-flight stabilization and contains the parts needed for reproduction. They also have six legs and two pairs of two sets of wings. Dragonflies have transparent wings, called hyaline, In entomology, which is the study of insects, hyaline refers to the transparent substance of fish fins and insect wings. You'll notice that their wings have veins on them, and the joints where these veins come together is made up of something called resilin, which is a protein that's kind of stretchy. This allows the wings to be flexible and for them to recover quickly. And something really interesting about this is that grasshoppers have that same protein in their leg joints. Wing muscles make up about 60% of the dragonfly's body weight, and each of their four wings are able to move independently of each other. This gives them some added agility while flying. And they fly in a similar way that birds do, using the thrust and lift process, where the hind wings generate thrust. Dragonflies can fly over 4 miles per hour, which is pretty quick for such a little animal. And they're such great flyers that some researchers are trying to mimic dragonfly flight in the production of drones that could be used for surveillance. Now, there is another insect that looks very similar to a dragonfly called a damselfly, and it's easy to get them mixed up. 
but there are a lot of differences between the two. Damselflies are usually smaller and skinnier than dragonflies, and they tend to hold their wings over their back, while dragonflies hold their wings out beside their bodies. Dragonflies, along with damselflies, form the taxonomic group Odonta, which can be traced back over 250 million years ago, appearing before dinosaurs during the late Paleozoic period. They're covered in sensory hairs called setae that are important receptors for smell, touch, and sensing temperature. And there's fossil evidence to show that the ancestors of dragonflies were much larger than the ones that we had today. Some of them had two and a half foot wingspans, which is about the same size as a duck's wingspan. The reason for this could be that the Paleozoic era had much higher amounts of oxygen in the atmosphere, which allowed them to grow larger. Okay, now that we've got some background info on these animals, let's find out what they eat, right after the break. The person that I want to recognize on this week's episode of Notable Figures in Science is George Washington Carver. He was born as a slave in Missouri, but was freed in 1865 after slavery was abolished. He left his home when he was only 10 so that he could get an education, and was really interested in plants. He went to high school in Kansas, but was denied when he applied to college in Kansas because he was black. Luckily, he was accepted into Iowa State University, where he got his degree in agricultural science. After this, he was hired as the director of the agricultural department in Tuskegee, Alabama, and he spent his life trying to solve the South's agricultural issues. He helped farmers create fertile soil by showing them that they could plant peanuts, sweet potatoes, and soybeans. He won many awards throughout his life and met with so many influential people, like Henry Ford, Gandhi, and he almost worked with Thomas Edison. If you want to learn more about George Washington Carver or this series, check out onwildlife.org. Okay, we're back. Dragonflies are insectivores, meaning that they mainly feed on other insects that they catch. They really like to eat mosquitoes and gnats, which I think we can all be thankful for. One study found that the larva of the scarlet skimmer dragonfly was able to control how large a population of mosquitoes could get. Also on the menu for these insects are flies, moths, butterflies, bees, and even other dragonflies and they can eat about 15% of their body weight every day. But what eats them? Mostly birds, spiders, and insects called robber flies, also known as assassin flies. Remember when I was talking about how a dragonfly's eyes could help to orient them when they're making all these crazy moves in the air? Well, they're also useful for hunting prey. Their huge eyes actually contain about 30,000 simple eyes called ametidia, and the eyes work independently of each other to really hone in on the movement of their prey. When an insect or object moves in front of their eyes, neurons that lead from each simple eye fire in a sequence, making the brain see a mosaic of all the moving images. And they can even predict the movements that their prey will make using that mosaic. So they're basically doing physics in their head by calculating the trajectory of their prey. They have three main ways of foraging for prey, and they're all called different things based on what they do. Hawkers capture their flying prey while they're also in flight. Salliers watch for prey to fly past them and then they dart out at them and grab them. And lastly, gleaners look for more stationary prey. Then they dart at it, land, and eat the prey. A grouping of dragonflies is called a cluster, but they're not very social. When they do meet up, it's so that they can mate. Something that these animals need in order to mate is water. That's where their females lay their eggs, which is why you'll oftentimes find dragonflies in wetland habitats or near rivers and ponds. A lot of the time, they like bodies of water that are close to trees and forests because it helps to give them cover from predators. 
And scientists have seen that the more we cut down trees, the less dragonflies there will be in that area. Dragonfly males also have specific territories that they'll defend because it's really important in their mating rituals. To scare other males away from their territory, they'll display their abdomen at them while aggressively hovering over their competitor. To attract females, some species will court them by guarding an area that's suitable for laying eggs. This area is called an oviposition site. When a female enters their territory, a mate will then fly towards the female and reverse slowly towards the site. If the female follows him, she's interested and then they'll mate. Males can attempt to mate with their females mid-flight or at rest. And this mating in flight is called in tandem because the male and the female become interlocked together. And what's really insane about this is that if a second male reproduces with a female before her eggs have been fertilized, then that male is able to scoop out the other male's sperm with his reproductive organ and replace it with his own. The way that the female lays her eggs depends on the species, and there are two ways that this could happen. Exophytic oviposition is where she drops her eggs in water, and epiphytic oviposition is where she lays her eggs on plants that are hanging above the water. Just like many insects, dragonflies have different life cycles. The egg, larva, also known as a nymph, and the adult. Dragonflies are able to lay about 2,000 eggs at a time, and they can develop in about 8 weeks. But there is evidence to suggest that warmer temperatures can actually speed up how long it takes for them to develop. That's why the area in which a female lays her eggs is really important. Dragonflies spend most of their lives in the larval stage. In order to get to the adult stage, they have to go through metamorphosis, which consists of them molting many different times, which is just a fancy way of saying that they shed their skin. The adults usually live for a much shorter amount of time than the larva. The larva can live for months to years. They also have slender bodies like the adults, but probably their most important feature is their rectum. They use their rectum for digestion, but the rectum also has gills that help them breathe underwater. The gills are able to take in oxygen from the water and remove carbon dioxide from their bodies. And once larvae have undergone their metamorphosis, dragonflies spend most of their adult life hunting, avoiding predators, mating, and looking for mates. Okay, we're going to take our last break, and when we get back, you'll hear about some more dragonfly behaviors. Time for today's trivia question. What is the largest planet in the solar system? A. Saturn B. Jupiter C. Neptune or D. Uranus The answer is Jupiter. It has a diameter of almost 87,000 miles compared to Earth's 8,000 miles. Okay, we're back. Part of the uniqueness of dragonflies is their ability to adapt. To avoid predators, Female dragonflies have evolved to have colors that blend in with their surroundings to camouflage them. This is very similar to birds because males have vibrant colors to attract mates while females have duller colors. At lower temperatures, males can also camouflage themselves by changing colors. For example, the males of a certain species can change from bright blue to gray. As I mentioned before, Males can guard territories, and the areas that they protect can be huge. Male darner dragonflies can protect around 20,000 feet squared, but the size of their territory depends on the species. This territorial behavior creates space between males in an area and improves the chances that they can mate. This is necessary because there can be about one female for every 10 to 100 males. The disparity between the sexes is really what determines their behaviors. Some non-territorial species will just fly along the water's edge until they find a female. 
And adult dragonflies can travel tens to hundreds of miles in their lifetime. Scientists have observed green darner dragonflies migrating up to 900 miles, traveling from Canada to Mexico because of climate change. While dragonflies provide little economic significance, they're a good indicator species for freshwater ecosystem health, as they're influenced by water contamination and environmental change. This means that they can tell scientists about the health of freshwater areas. If dragonflies aren't present where they should be, we know something's wrong. They also play a key role in the food web as both predator and prey, and their disappearance could cause food web disruption. Remember that they're a predator of mosquitoes, which could cause a large amount of damage if they're left unchecked. According to the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, dragonfly populations are decreasing because of human pressures, including habitat loss, agriculture, and climate change. Luckily, there are some great organizations that are helping dragonflies right now. You should check out the Worldwide Dragonfly Association, the Migratory Dragonfly Partnership, and the Dragonfly Society of the Americas. Thank you so much for coming on this adventure with me as we explored the world of dragonflies. You can find the sources that we used for this podcast and links to organizations that we reference at onwildlife.org. You can also email us with any questions at onwildlife.podcast at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Instagram at on underscore wildlife or on TikTok at onwildlife. Don't forget to tune in next Wednesday for another awesome episode. And that's On Wildlife. You've been listening to On Wildlife with Alex Ray. On Wildlife provides general educational information on various topics as a public service, which should not be construed as professional, financial, real estate, tax, or legal advice. These are our personal opinions only. Please refer to our full disclaimer policy on our website for full details. 